Professor Yang, guests, colleagues, students. Good morning and welcome to the Chinese University of Hong Kong. My name is MC Chu. I'm the MC, just because of my name. I'm the MC of this event this morning. So this morning is a very happy and very special occasion. We come together for the celebration of the 90th birthday of Professor Xian Yang. Um, I thought for a long time this morning how to introduce Professor Yang to you. Uh, he's such a distinguished and influential physicist. Probably, if I, if I were to read all his contributions and awards, it would take up a full hour. So instead, I decided to just tell you one among his contributions, which is actually related to the talk you hear today. Now, recently, you might have heard a lot of news about the discovery of the Higgs light particle. And a lot of newspapers would have you believed that the Higgs particle explained all the masses in the universe, including your mass. Now, in fact, that's not correct. Most of your mass is in the protons and neut neutrons. And for many years, physicists have tried to solve the problem. How come the quarks come together to form the protons and gluons? and how the mass of protons and neutrons come about. It turned out after many years of efforts, it turned out that the quarks come together because there's also something called gluons, and the interactions among the gluons and the gluons and the quarks are actually described by a theory that was constructed by Professor Xian Yang almost 50 years ago. So the yang Mills theory explain why we have protons and neutrons, and explain most of your masses. So in fact, if you ever ponder about your existence, at least in this form, um, Professor Xian Yang is actually the person who wrote down the theory to explain it all, not really the Higgs particle. And Professor Yang today will also tell you that Higgs particle is actually a consequence of Yang Mills theory. So, Professor Yang has been associated with our university for a long time. Uh, in 1986, Professor Yang graciously accepted a special chair as the distinguished Professor Lash with CUHK. 1999, Professor Yang donated his collection of papers, articles, letters, and even his Nobel Prize medal to us. You can actually visit the Xian Yang um, archive uh, in the university library. I'm sure you don't get to touch the Nobel Prize medal, but you get to see it, and it's worth it. Uh, he has even taught, he has co-taught a course here uh, for several years together with Professor Yang. So many of our undergraduates have, have actually been taught by Professor Yang himself. So today we celebrate his 90th birthday, and we start off this event by a popular science talk this morning by another person that I don't know how to introduce because he's so well known, so respected, and well loved by the physics community in Hong Kong. Professor Kenneth Young obtained his bachelor and PhD degree both from California Institute of Technology uh, he has worked in many areas in physics, including particle physics, field theory, polymer science, and dissipative science systems. He's well regarded as an outstanding researcher and teacher. He has served this university in many different capacities. He was our physics department chairman. He was a dean of science faculty. He was a dean of uh, graduate schools and then he served as the provice chancellor of the university. And I think in some years, he actually served these uh, different positions at the same time. It's amazing how he could do that. It's quantum mechanical, any time I think about this. Um, in the four, new four-year physics colloquium, Professor Yang is now actually teaching a first-year undergraduate major course, University of Physics One in collaboration with Dr. S.S. Tong. Uh, so if you come into our university as a physics major, the first course you'll be taught by Professor Young. Uh, 
Currently, Professor Yang is master of the newly established CW2 College at CUHK, the newest college here. He also continues his service to the community in the capacity of the chairman of the Hong Kong Curriculum Development Council. So let's welcome Professor Yang to give his talk. Uh, thank you, MC, for that uh, kind introduction. I'm uh, delighted to have this opportunity uh, to give this talk uh, to such a large audience uh, and in celebration of Professor Yang's uh, birthday. And of course, Professor Yang is my hero uh, as much as he is yours. So uh, the topic I'm going to talk about uh, is uh, the Higgs boson and Yang Wills theory, and I style it as a tribute to Professor Xian Yang on the occasion of his 90th birthday. You must have heard about the Higgs boson uh, and have read about it in the popular press. What I hope to do today is to go into it at, in a little bit more depth uh, than what you might otherwise read, have read uh, in the newspapers, uh, because otherwise, what's the point? So first of all, uh, by way of introduction, the first reason we want to talk about the Higgs boson uh, today is because it is in the news. Uh, you must have read uh, in the newspapers uh, headlines such as these, and for most of us, we probably didn't go much beyond the headlines. Uh, this is all in the last few months, uh, for example, like this. And the formal uh, announcement of the exciting experimental result, though it's slightly tentative, uh, was only a couple of months ago at the 36th International Conference on High Energy Physics in July, held in Melbourne. Uh, that was when uh, the, the news really broke. And the experimentalists, uh, especially from CERN, made the announcement on July 4th, uh, the day before the conference actually started. They um, made the announcement in Geneva. For example, the spokesperson for ATLAS, and I'll come to what ATLAS means, just an acronym, uh, uh, said the following. So we observe in our data clear signs of a new particle. This is the new particle we want to talk about. At the level of five sigma, that means five standard deviations, in the Mars region, 126 uh, GeV. A GeV, uh, for simplicity, is a unit of mass about the same as that of a proton. Okay? But a little more time is needed to prepare these results for publication. The other experiment, there are two experiments going on at the same time in CERN, CMS, and this statement was by Joe Incandela, who actually gave a talk uh, in CUHK uh, on his way back from Melbourne. Uh, uh, and, uh, results were about the same. Results are preliminary, but the five sigma uh, uh, signal at about 125 GeV, so agree to about one unit, this is indeed a new particle. And the CERN overall director, both, are, both experiments are, were carried out in CERN, and the CERN research director uh, had the following statement on the same day. It's hard not to get excited by these results, a new Higgs-like particle. So they, they were being extremely careful. They did not claim, and to this day, they do not claim that they have found the Higgs boson. They say they find a Higgs-like particle, a particle that has some of the properties of the Higgs boson, but they are not yet ready to swear that it is. We are at a branching point. The observation of this new particle indicates the path for the future. And the future will be many years coming, and perhaps uh, many young people in the audience may have a chance to contribute uh, to the future path of this uh, endeavor towards a more detailed understanding of what we are seeing in the data. Uh, so Peter Higgs uh, was actually in tears. He was in the audience at that announcement. Uh, he was so moved, uh, he was in tears. Uh, there was a recent article in Science, uh, and my attention was drawn to it by uh, Professor P.M. Hui, uh, only, I think, yesterday, uh, that says uh, maybe Peter Hicks' contribution is not as big as, as uh, my otherwise, you might otherwise think, but we'll come to that later. Uh, actually, the day before July 3rd, there is actually another experiment being done in America uh, in the collaboration called CDF, and one day earlier, they, they tried to make an announcement they, but they say, rather modestly, they had actually not quite as good data. Our data strongly point towards, a very careful choice of words, uh, the existence of the Higgs boson, but it will take results from the experiments at LHC. LHC are the two CERN experiments I just referred to, uh, to establish a discovery. So uh, they were a bit modest, but I am told that they were warned off by the CERN team not to make too much of a claim. Uh, 
So uh, the press, the media went crazy and referred to this as the God particle, okay? And including a bit of nonsense uh, about conscious cosmology. Nothing, there's nothing about conscious co cosmology. In the Chinese press as well, uh, Sanghi Legion. Is it really the God particle? Uh, I hardly think so. That's a, a bit of an exaggeration. Uh, uh, and I think the origin of that term was actually uh, uh, a rather some slightly profane remark by, by somebody uh, a bit earlier on. Uh, but uh, in this audience, I won't repeat the profane remark. Uh, if you do believe in God, then all things bright and beautiful, all particles great and small, the Lord God made them all. Uh, that, in other words, uh, if there is a God, he made all particles, not just this one, and there is no reason to call this uh, the God particle. In fact, my theme today is that perhaps we shouldn't call it the God particle, but we should call it the Yang particle. <laughs> and uh, I say that slightly in jest, but not completely in jest. Uh, there is a case to be made uh, for the very serious, uh, very important connection with the work of Professor C. N. Yang, uh, whom uh, we uh, admire so much. And of course, the, reason, uh, the second reason I want to talk about this topic is, of course, uh, we are coming close to Professor Yang's 90th birthday. And uh, in fact, uh, we are holding a one-day celebration and ending with a, with a banquet in his honor this evening. His real birthday is in just two weeks' time. Okay? And uh, this is uh, Professor Yang. Now, the reason for connecting the two uh, is because the Higgs boson, the Higgs mechanism, is a phenomenon that exists only in Yang Mills theory, as Professor Chi has already told you. And it solves a very important problem in Yang Mills theory, uh, the problem of the mass of the intermediate vector boson. And it solves the problem also of the masses of the fundamental fermions. Now, this is not the mass of the proton and neutron, but the masses of the fundamental fermions, the quarks uh, and the uh, uh, leptons, the charged leptons, uh, that are more fundamental than the proton and neutron. And interestingly, and this is something that uh, people don't emphasize as much as they ought to, uh, it, the Higgs boson gives rise to the masses of these fermions because of another contribution by Yang. In fact, the contribution that won him together with T.D. Lee uh, the Nobel Prize for parity violation. And I will try to explain that a little bit. Now, the uh, question that the physicists, and in fact, all of mankind since antiquity have been interested in, is what is matter made of, and how do they interact? And in all civilization, Chinese, Indian, Greek, you would find speculative answers uh, to these questions. But of course, by the 20th, uh, 20th 21st century, uh, these are no longer speculative philosophical questions, but they are scientific questions subject to experimental measurement and test. To put it very simply, and not entirely correctly, uh, I have to apologize. Many statements I make today will not be entirely correct, all right? Uh, because I need to make things relatively simple, but I hope that they are fundamentally correct. Matter is made of fermions, and they interact by the exchange of bosons. And the Higgs particle is a boson. So these are two words that we need to understand a little bit. Bosons are particles that like to congregate. They like to come together in the same state and they have a property that their spin uh, comes in integral units, 0, 1, 2, and so on. And light is the most familiar example of a boson. Photons are, uh, are, are particles of light. They like to come together in the same state, or at least if you do something to them, they would come together in the same state. And when that happens, uh, you have this, a laser, okay? The, the photons in this, uh, uh, creating this red spot comes from a tiny laser here, and they are all lasing, they are coming into the same state. Uh, so these are bosons, and they obey Bose-Einstein statistics, and this is um, uh, Bose, uh, who contributed to this idea. And when uh, such things happen, we say they undergo Bose-Einstein condensation. They come into the same state, almost like steam condensing, okay? And this is a hot topic of research these days, a Bose-Einstein condensate of atoms. And this, there will be a talk uh, this afternoon on a BEC, Bose-Einstein condensate by Professor Jason Ho, uh, uh, who has done important work in this area, won a big prize. Uh, he is an alumnus of our department. Uh, the two bosons that we will uh, be making reference to today are the intermediate vector boson with spin one. Uh, I have referred to that. And of course, uh, uh, 
the Higgs boson uh, with spin zero. Fermions, on the other hand, uh, they have the property that they don't like to uh, come together. They exclude each other, almost like you, uh, the audience of, uh, on seats. If one person is in one seat, the second person cannot uh, be in the same seat. Okay? So they have to occupy different states. And this property of excluding one another is called the Pauli exclusion principle. And, and we say uh, it, uh, they obey Pauli Dirac statistics. And the name fermion is named after Fermi, uh, who is shown here. And by the way, without Fermi Dirac statistics, there would be no chemistry. Uh, because the second, the third, the fifth, the 90th second electron would all go into the 1s state, and everything would be just uh, like hydrogen. And uh, we, would, we can then forget about the chemistry department. Uh, sorry, Thomas. Uh, the fundamental fermions that we are talking about, uh, nature is made of uh, these fundamental fermions. That the top uh, table refer to the lighter particles that interact only electrically and weakly. They are called the leptons. Leptons is just a weak word for being light. They are the three types of neutrinos, and then there are three types of electron like particles with minus one unit of charge. And then there are six types of quarks. Uh, with fractional charges, either two-thirds units or minus one-third units, and I won't go through the names. And uh, whether the leptons or the quarks, they exist in what we call three generations. And this is actually a great mystery, why there should be three generations, and what are the relationship between among the three generations. This remains a mystery today, and we don't understand why. Uh, the world of physicists are trying to at least measure some properties related uh, to the relationship among these three generations. And in particular, uh, probably the second most important uh, announcement in experimental particle physics today uh, is due to a team of which uh, uh, Professor M.C. Chu is a part. That was an experiment, that is an experiment being done in the Daya Bay to measure the oscillation among the three generations of neutrinos. And Professor Ju will be uh, giving a talk this afternoon in, in the symposium. So the three types of neutrinos actually turn into each other in a, with a particular rate. And a parameter related to the oscillation between one and three uh, was measured and announced for the first time uh, this year uh, to great precision and a bit of fanfare by the Daya Bay experiment, uh, of which uh, not only Professor Ju, but some of our students uh, are a part. But uh, my talk today about Higgs particle uh, focuses more on the vertical relationship within a column, which we call a doublet, a pair of particles, for example, the, neutrino, the electron neutrino and the electron, that differ by one unit of charge. The one on top has one unit of charge more than the one uh, at the bottom. And this is true both uh, for the leptons and also for the quarks. So this is a doublet, this is a doublet, this is a doublet. By the way, uh, neutrons and protons are made up of U and D only. All right, so most of us are made up of just U, D, and the electron. Right? That constitutes uh, much of what uh, uh, is in here. Oh, by the way, I have to uh, make a confession. I said matter is made up of all these things, and if I give that answer in the exam, I would get a mark of 4 out of 100. Uh, because that is only ordinary matter, such as the matter in this room. If you look at matter in the universe, 96% is made up of something else that nobody knew anything about, say, 30 years ago. And uh, the other 96% consists of dark matter and dark energy. And I say that uh, just to let young people know that there are still lots and lots of unanswered questions and new discoveries down the road for you to work on. Uh, the story is by no means finished. Professor Ji has uh, referred to the uh, problem of creating mass, and here I mean only the mass of the fundamental particles. I don't mean the mass in the protons and neutrons, uh, much of which is due to uh, motion, kinetic energy. There are actually three problems, and this is something I think you don't get by simply reading the papers. First of all is the question of creating the mass of the intermediate vector boson. That's by far the most important idea. Then the masses of the fermions and the mass of the Higgs boson itself. And the rough idea, and I think you have read about this in the papers as well, an analogy, that the vacuum is not empty, but it's filled with the Higgs field, which is like the soup or, or a, a bunch of molasses, so that if you imagine yourself uh, walking or swimming in molasses, of course, uh, it becomes very sluggish, and that means uh, there is more, more mass. So the, a non-trivial vacuum 
can make a particle acquire more mass. And this idea of an effective mass is actually a very well-known idea, that a particle in a medium has an effective mass that is different from its original or bare mass is quite well-known. For example, the electron mass in semiconductors is not the electron mass that you find in tables. It is different because of interactions uh, with the uh, uh, medium. Uh, it can be larger, very often it is larger, but it can also be smaller due to the interactions. And I just uh, want to cite an example that in gallium arsenides, it's actually much smaller, only one-fifteenth of the normal mass. And that is why electrons in gallium arsenide uh, can jump up and down very rapidly, and gallium arsenide is very good for optoelectronic devices because of the speed of its operation. And the Higgs field, uh, the Higgs is just uh, the soup. That explanation that you read in the paper is not a real explanation. It doesn't explain the real subtleties uh, which makes this topic so interesting. Uh, because we have to understand why the original mass of the intermediate vector boson is exactly zero. It doesn't change from, say, 1 to 1.1. It changes from zero to a particular unit. Secondly, even as it acquires a mass, somehow it has to continue to appear as if to fool people into thinking that it is zero. And this is this subtlety that makes this field uh, so interesting. Likewise, for the fermions, the original mass has to be zero. And of course, uh, we have to talk about the mass of the Higgs boson itself, which is an experimental measurement. So that's my way of introduction, and these are the topics I will try to quickly cover. The most important idea, and only a few formulas uh, uh, will be shown, uh, is actually due to Yukawa, uh, who relates the mass of a particle and the range of the interaction that it mediates. So the questions we want to answer are, what are the ultimate constituents of matter and how do they interact? And Yukawa tells us uh, that they interact by exchanging other elementary particles. And he wrote down this famous equation, and this is the only equation you need to know. And it says that the range of interaction, R, is inversely proportional to the mass M of the particle that's being interchanged. Uh, with two constants, the Planck constant h, h bar, and the velocity of light c. So when an interaction happens, uh, you exchange a certain mass, m, and the range of the interaction thus created uh, by a very simple argument uh, is inversely proportional uh, to uh, the mass. Okay? So if you exchange a heavy particle, the range is very short. That's the key idea. All right? And the first application of this idea by Yukawa himself was to explain the interaction between two protons that scatter off each other by the exchange of a particle, which we now know, know to be the pi. And the pi has a mass of 0.14 units. Remember, the unit is roughly the mass of a proton. And if you just plug that into that formula, the Yukawa formula, you come out with a range of a one femtometer. A femto is uh, 10 to the minus 15, right? And that's just right. Actually, I'm telling the story uh, in a reverse way. What we originally know was the range, and from that you uh, predict the mass of the exchange particle. Now, uh, the Higgs particle, the Higgs boson, Higgs field, has to do with weak interactions, and let me try to explain that a little bit. This is the fundamental equation due to Yukawa, relating the range and the mass. But the mystery of the weak interactions, and this is, I think, the central theme of the talk today, is that experimentally, the range is very small. This is something uh, you measure. This is an experimental fact that uh, in the weak interactions, for example, beta decay, the range is extremely small, roughly speaking, about one part in 1,000 of the radius of a proton. But CN Yang tells us that the mass responsible for that uh, interaction is actually zero. Okay? So now, if you look at those two things and plug it into this formula, something is wrong, right? How can you have m being zero and r being small? If m is zero, r is infinite. That is the fundamental uh, contra apparent contradiction uh, that faced the world of physics and which the Higgs particle uh, solved. Okay? Now, normally, when you have an experimental fact, as in the first line, and a three theorist idea in the second line, and they conflict, you throw the theorist out of the window. Right? But in this case, the theory of Yang was so beautiful, people thought that it should be taken very seriously. So now let me uh, tell you a little bit about Yang-Mills theory. 
fundamental uh, uh, interactions among particles are of four types and uh, listed in the order of their strength. And it turns out that Yang Mills theory now provides a unified description of the first three. Okay. So a great interaction. So between Yang Mills and Einstein, it is three to one. So what is Yang Mills theory? Why does it require the mass of the boson to be zero? And how did Higgs resolve the contradiction? The key idea of gauge theory is a paradox that some things in the theory are needed, but they do not matter. Things are needed, but they do not matter. So uh, this may recall to you a, a similar, uh, well, in quantum mechanics, those of you who have studied quantum mechanics knows that you are talking about a complex wave function psi, and the probability is what you measure, uh, which is the absolute square of the wave function. So if I change the phase of the wave function by multiplying uh, by e to the i theta, it doesn't change anything. So because you have to talk about a complex number, the phase is needed, but the phase does not matter. And the phase, for those of you who don't know complex numbers, is just like the position of the hand of a clock, like an angle in going around a circle. Okay? So that's quantum mechanics. Now, in electromagnetism, there is also something uh, that you have to mention, but does not matter. The absolute voltage does not matter. And I think anybody uh, who has studied even elementary electricity knows this. Uh, and you must have heard about this if you have a pigeon standing on one uh, 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 electric wire, and the electric wire is at very high voltage, 10 kilovolts, uh, the pigeon is actually quite comfortable. Uh, the absolute value of the voltage does not matter. But if uh, he, the pigeon has one foot on each of two wires, and the difference between the two voltages is 10 kilovolts. The difference matters. And if there is a difference, uh, and if, in other words, if V1 minus V2 is large, uh, then you can get uh, ready to eat uh, rose pigeon, for which, incidentally, uh, Shatin is famous. So that means if the absolute value of the voltage does not matter, then I am entitled to add a constant to every voltage. So the, abs the constant value does not matter. And the generalization of that statement, and here I have to be a bit abstract, the voltage is one example of what we call the four potential, A mu, and you can change A mu by adding something uh, that looks like the gra that's a gradient, all right? And that part does not matter. So that's just a generalized idea of adding a constant uh, to the potential. Gauge theory actually relates these two ideas. Remember I told you that the phase theta of a uh, wave function, complex wave function, does not matter. And I now just told you that you can add the gradient of this to EM. And it turns out this idea in quantum mechanics and this idea in uh, electromagnetism are related. And that you, can, you should do the two together and even allow this uh, to be position dependent. That is the key idea of gauge theory, which was not invented by yet. What Yang Mills did was a generalization of the idea, originally like the hand on a clock face in two dimensions, so only one angle. They generalized it to the idea of a hand uh, of it pointing to the surface of a globe. Right? So it is the surface, the two-dimensional surface of a globe rather than a plate. And I have some uh, symbols there, uh, never mind. So he generalized it from two-dimensional internal space to three-dimensional internal space. And this is the famous paper of Yang and Mills, and uh, slightly enlarged. And interestingly, that paper published in 1954 uh, was on 1st of October, Professor Yang's birthday. Okay? Uh, likewise, his uh, parity paper. Now I have to corrupt the young people. Uh, you have all learned uh, uh, multiplication that A times B is equal to B times A, I have to tell you that is not always the case. And in Yang Mills' uh, theories, you have to deal with objects that obey multiplication rules uh, that we say do not commute. A, B is not equal to B, A. That simply means in three dimensions, if I rotate, do a rotation A and then do a rotation B, that's not the same as doing it in the reverse order. But this is a beautiful theory, Yang Mills' theory, published in 1954. But it was largely ignored because of a basic difficulty. And this is a quote from the, uh, that paper. Uh, 
we come to the question of the mass of the B quantum. The B quantum is just our intermediate vector boson. We do not have a satisfactory answer. Nowadays, if you write a paper to which you do not have a satisfactory answer, uh, the referee will reject the paper, okay? Uh, uh, those are more tolerant times. And so it goes on to say a conclusion about the mass of the B quantum is, of course, very important in deciding whether the proposal is consistent with experimental information. Experimental information means that the mass uh, is actually large. Although uh, that original paper did not refer to weak, weak interactions. Uh, one person who commented on this paper was the famous physicist Pauli, and the top is his, his hand, handwritten letter to Professor Yang. Uh, the bottom, uh, you know, the handwriting was pretty bad, so Professor Yang actually typed it out for a record, and here I have enlarged it. But I was and still am disgusted of the vector field corresponding to particles with zero mass. So that is such a major problem because it disagreed with the very simple formula I wrote down. So Paulis uh, was extremely unhappy with this proposal. And the resolution of this paradox, there are two resolutions. Uh, the first in strong interactions, and that is something that Professor Chu referred to earlier, uh, is that the mass is indeed zero, and the range is indeed infinite. And the fact that it is infinite means that quarks uh, continue to interact even when they are very far away, and you never see a free quark. Uh, that is part of Yang Mill's theory. Uh, but that's not what I'm going to talk about today, not that aspect, because that doesn't have to do with the Higgs particle. The second resolution in a different domain is the weak interactions, and it is resolved uh, by the Higgs mechanism. And this whole idea of Yang Mill's fields has spawned so many Nobel Prizes. Uh, uh, I will just uh, show you a few. Uh, all these are related one way or another uh, to the Yang Mills theory. Uh, for example, just show you the next one. Uh, the 204 Nobel Prize uh, was given to these three people for proving asymptotic freedom theoretically within the context of Yang Mills theories and showing that only Yang Mills has this uh, uh, property. Uh, Gross, I think, uh, gave a talk here a few years ago. Uh, when you write that, do Yang Mills theory, the first things you write down is a Yang Mills Lagrangian, which roughly looks like this. And the first two terms uh, talk, tell you about the intermediate vector bosons. Uh, there is uh, something that I have sort of just indicated symbolically, uh, the Higgs mechanism to give it mass. And then uh, that term with the two Fs are the interactions with fermions and uh, only interacting with the left-hand part of the fermions. Of course, you, most of you won't understand that, but I just want to tell you the following, that when you study classical mechanics, uh, as I teach classical mechanics to year one students uh, starting this, uh, uh, this last week, whenever you do classical mechanics, the first thing you write down is F equals MA, Newton's laws, and everything flows from there. So now, when you study particle physics, the first thing you write down is a yang mills lagrangian and everything flows from there, okay? Now let me explain a little bit about the weak interactions. The basic weak interaction goes like this. Uh, the left-hand side, D and U, is a doublet. The right-hand side, neutrino and electron, is another doublet. So what happens is that one member of the doublet goes along, the D goes along, turns into a U by emitting a W. The, dub, the neutrino goes along, absorbs a W, and turns into an electron. So that is the fundamental scheme uh, of a weak interaction. Uh, you can turn an incoming neutrino to an outgoing antineutrino. That, that's a basic rule that is always allowed. So you have the D turning into U plus electron plus antineutrino, and that is roughly what is measured uh, in, in Dia Bay. Uh, or, or, although, and also you can act to, to spectators, uh, other quarks that are doing nothing except uh, uh, you know, just being there. And it turns out uh, that uh, when you add those spectators, uh, this is a neutron and that is a proton. Okay? That is more precisely uh, what is happening in Dia Bay. Okay, this gives off energy, which powers this electricity, and the antineutrinos are, are what uh, Professor Chu measures. But uh, we need to understand the vertex, the intermediate vector boson, the polarization, gauge symmetry, and higher order terms. So the vertex, by the vertex we mean uh, uh, that thing, and it always occurs uh, between a, two members of a doublet uh, emitting or absorbing a W. Uh, it can be any doublet, but only the left-handed part. And this is uh, the result uh, of the uh, Li-Yang parity violation that flows uh, from the Li-Yang parity violation that distinguishes the left hand from the right hand. 
uh, that is only the left-handed part for reasons that we don't understand of which interacts. Secondly is the intermediate vector boson, which is the red line in the middle, and this would, could be the W or the Z. And to repeat uh, the central point, uh, this object has a large mass and a small range. An important point, which is often uh, omitted in uh, popular discussion, is the polarization. And I suppose most uh, young students here would have studied some electricity and magnetism and would know that the photon or the electromagnetic field is transversely polarized. That means uh, if the wave is propagating in this direction, then the, let's say the electric field indicated in red here uh, would propagate, would vibrate this way, and the magnetic field will vibrate that way, both of which is, are transverse to the direction of propagation. And it is transverse, it turns out, because photons have zero mass. And the fact that it has zero mass allows you to ban the third possible polarization, which is longitudinal. If the mass is not zero, uh, then there would be three polarizations. You can no longer ban uh, the longitudinal polarization. Now, you can write that with fancy formulas, but the idea is actually very simple. If the mass is not zero, then I can run along together with the photon because uh, uh, it cannot be traveling at the velocity at, at C. Okay? If I run along, uh, then I don't know what is the uh, longitudinal polarization. I cannot distinguish between transverse and longitudinal. So it's obvious uh, I am not allowed to ban the longitudinal polarization. But then you see that if the mass changes from zero to even slightly non-zero, it is not a continuous change because the polarization changes from two to three. It's a qualitative change. Even if the mass is tiny, 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 it's a qualitative change. The polarization goes from two to three. So if you were somehow to have a mechanism that turns on the mass, you have to steal a polarization from somewhere. And that is one of the problems that Higgs solved. Okay? Now, but then you can ask, why do we insist the mass to be zero, theoretically? Why did Yang uh, require the mass to be zero? Well, uh, the reason that Yang proposed uh, was that otherwise it would ruin gauge invariance and the theory would not be elegant. That's a good answer, but it's not re a really perfect answer. Because uh, although we theoretical physicists like to have elegant theories, uh, you know, if, it, if the real world is inelegant, it's inelegant. Uh, you, you cannot use that as a perfectly strong argument. The argument, which uh, sometimes is, again, in popular accounts, uh, is not given, has to do with the higher order terms. So if you have, a, let's say, an uh, intermediate vector boson that's so moving along, it can absorb another intermediate vector boson with momentum k becomes k plus p, and then later on turn back to p. So a intermediate vector boson can have, uh, uh, can have an intermediate state for a short time being something else. Okay? And you must account for these things. Uh, it, they must happen. And if that happens, the value of k is totally arbitrary. So you have to add up all possibilities, add over all possible values of k. And mathematically, that means do an integral uh, over the, uh, the variable k. And k is a four-dimensional variable. And when you do that integral, it turns out it is horribly divergent. That is, you get a terrible infinity if m is not equal to 0. So that means if m is not equal to 0, the theory is not only inelegant, it is nonsense. Because if you continue to calculate, the next order, you get infinity, right? So it is inconsistent. It is an impossible theory. That is, a much, that is the real reason why m has to be zero. So in summary, there is something very special about m being zero, and we must maintain those features rigorously as if m is equal to zero uh, in order for the theory to be consistent. And the answer to that turns out to be the Higgs mechanism. And the key point, is to be or not to be, and the mass to be or not to be zero. This recalls uh, something that you might have heard about in wave particle duality, uh, whether a, a, wa a particle to be or not to be a wave. That sounds like a superficial contradiction, and in fact, the whole idea of quantum mechanics is built upon the recognition that you can have something that is at the same time a wave and a particle. Now, the Higgs me mechanism allows the intermediate vector boson to acquire mass. And the rough idea I have already described 
uh, Higgs uh, causing uh, the vacuum to be non-empty and behaving like a molasses. A more precise idea I can try to explain using pictures. So here is a W particle propagating along uh, with a mass M, and we indicate it that way. But in, in the Higgs mechanism, it also inter interacts uh, with the Higgs field, which I indicate by phi, uh, through this vertex, two Ws and two phi, uh, with a coupling constant G square. But if in vacuum, the Higgs field is not zero, but has a certain value V, that's called the vacuum expectation value, then the right-hand diagram is equivalent to the left-hand diagram uh, with m squared equal to g squared v squared. So the particle acquires a mass m equal to g squared v squared if there is a vacuum expectation value of the Higgs field. And you can express the same idea in formulas. Okay? And uh, I just want to uh, emphasize that what appears here uh, is a Yang-Mills covariant derivative uh, for the mathematicians, uh, uh, and a, a connection one form uh, that appears here. And there are further questions because the Higgs field cannot be a single field. Uh, it must be at least a pair of two fields, or maybe more. And in this two fields, say phi 1 points this way, phi 2 points that way, phi must uh, choose a particular direction. And that choosing a particular direction seems to break symmetry. And we say to break symmetry in a spontaneous way. That is, it by itself chooses to point in one particular direction when all directions are, uh, to start with, equivalent. And there are further questions. Uh, that, as I have told you before, the degrees of freedom seems wrong, uh, whether it's two degrees or three degrees of freedom, and we need to steal one uh, from somewhere. Now, why is it the case uh, that the Higgs uh, field is not zero in vacuum? Normally, we think the vacuum is everything is zero. Uh, this is what people usually write down. You may say it's, it's sort of uh, not a real answer, but that is the best thing that we have. Uh, the Higgs field creates a certain potential energy, which is related to the square and the fourth power of the field phi. And usually, you think of uh, the first coefficient as positive. So you have a square term and then a fourth power term. But there is actually no reason why uh, the first term cannot be negative. And if it is negative, the potential then goes as minus phi square. And then only when phi is large will it go back up as phi 4. And when that happens, the potential looks like this, okay? So uh, think of phi as two-dimensional, phi uh, two-dimensional, and the vertical uh, uh, dimension is the value of the potential. So you start off with minus phi square, and then for large phi, it goes up to phi fourth, and the potential then looks like this, which is typically called a Mexican hat potential, okay? Now, a Mexican hat has a groove, okay? Uh, this part, this ring, which is uh, at the lowest point, and the lowest point is not phi equal to zero, not the origin, but slightly displaced. So let me take a top view of the Mexican hat, and this is the ring uh, where the hat is the lowest. And if you move along the ring, you see it doesn't cost you any energy. You are moving at the same level around the ring. So this is what is called a zero energy excitation, and it's called a Goldstone boson. And this is where the extra polarization comes from for you to steal. It is a massless zero energy excitation that is extra, uh, ready to be stolen. This is called uh, the Higgs mechanism. But secondly, you can also move perpendicular to the ring. When you move perpendicular to the ring, remember the Mexican hat goes like this, you are moving up a well. Okay? And when you move up a well, it costs energy. When it, when it costs energy, that means that there is a mass. And this is the Higgs boson. Now, I am very careful to distinguish between the Higgs mechanism, which is necessary and already proven in the standard model, and the Higgs boson, uh, which is what is uh, supposedly new experimentally. Okay? And I think uh, in the interest of time, I will skip this part, uh, how it also provides mass uh, to the uh, fermions. Uh, and the mass is proportional to the strength of the interactions. Uh, except to say, why is the original mass of the fermions uh, equal to zero? Uh, and the, uh, why not, for example, why isn't the mass of the ice particle, uh, why doesn't it start off with some value and then acquire some extra bit due to the Higgs particle having a vacuum expectation value V? 
Uh, if that's the case, the mass would not be proportional to the coupling constant. And the answer, again, comes back to Professor Yang. This is a famous saying by Professor Yang that symmetry dictates interactions. Uh, and you can turn that around to say that interaction dictates symmetry. And the idea is the following, that Yang and Li in 1956 uh, proposed parity violation, that the left hand is not equal to the right hand. And in fact, we now know that it is violated maximally, namely that in the weak interactions, only the left hand part interacts. If only the left hand part interacts, then it cannot have mass. Now, seems like a mysterious statement. Uh, you can write formulas, fancy formulas with direct spinners and so on, but I can explain that rather heuristically. Left hand and right hand means the spin is spinning either this way or that way along the direction of motion. Okay? So it's a matter of, uh, for physicists, the helicity. But if the particle has mass, again, you can go to its rest frame. Then it doesn't have a direction of motion. So you cannot even distinguish between the left hand and the right hand. So the very fact that the interaction selects the left hand means that you are able to make that distinction which means you cannot ever go to the rest frame, which means the mass has to be zero to start with. And all the mass comes through the Higgs boson. Okay? So now let's come to Mr. Higgs. Uh, the whole idea was proposed in 1964 in three classic papers. Uh, the in chronological order, the first one by Englert and Brout. Uh, a few weeks later, uh, a few couple of months later, a paper by Higgs, and then a few months later yet, a paper by Goralnik, Hagen, and Kibble, proposing basically the same idea. Okay? Uh, if we have time, towards the end, we can discuss why, if Higgs was not the first paper, but the second, why everybody calls it the Higgs particle, and it looks like Higgs is going to win the Nobel Prize, if not the others. But uh, just to quote from the very first sentence of the very first paper, and to justify my claim uh, that the Higgs particle is really deeply related to Yang Mills, that sentence says, it is of interest to inquire whether gauge vector mesons acquire mass, this is what we've been talking about, through interaction. By a gauge vector meson, we mean a Yang-Mills field associated with the extension of a Lie group from global to local symmetry. All right? uh, and, and if you want to know what is a Lie group, come join the mathematics department. So there is a question of priority uh, for the three papers, and those who are very careful refers to this mechanism in this long-winded way as the Englert, Brout, Hicks, Graunick, Hagen, Kibble mechanism. And uh, they jo uh, jointly won the Sakura Prize in 2010 for this uh, event. Uh, you see one person is missing. Uh, Hicks was unable to make that ceremony. But Hicks actually, if uh, Hicks has a claim on the Nobel Prize, he was not perhaps the uh, earliest, uh, but he actually made a statement about a new particle. Uh, you could say that all three papers discuss the Higgs mechanism. Only the Higgs paper talk about Higgs particle, but in a very casual way. Uh, the only thing he said is, is just uh, uh, these few words. Uh, quoted from his paper that equation 2b describes waves whose quanta have bare mass blah. And the bare mass now turns out to be 125 or 26. Okay? Uh, the other guys didn't mention this. So who's going to win the next Nobel? Oh, it turns out Brout has died a couple of years ago. That uh, uh, leaves five. Nobel prizes can go to only, each Nobel prize can at most go to three people. So maybe Englert and Hicks. Maybe Englert and Hicks and Yang. Maybe the two experiments. We don't know. So the question is whether the mass is zero or not zero. And to summarize, uh, gauge invariance means that certain things do not matter. Uh, the longitudinal part, the source of trouble doesn't matter. In gauge invariance, you can get rid of the longitudinal part. And that is summarized in this formula for the gauge propagator. And it turns out this parameter, because C, uh, can be chosen to be anything you want. And that is what basically allows you to get rid of the uh, longitudinal part and make things finite. Not just beautiful, but finite. So now I come to this, what's called the standard model for the weak interactions, uh, for which uh, Weinberg, Salam, and Glashow uh, won the Nobel Prize, I don't know which year, but uh, they did it in 1967. Uh, this is a theory that unifies weak interactions and EM interactions, and it is based on uh, a, a, the following Lie group, SU2 for the left-hand part and U1. And because it involves two parts, it has two coupling constants. And the ratio between those two coupling constants is uh, 
uh, called the tangent of a certain angle called the Weinberg angle, and its value is measured. And the vacuum expectation is now known. Uh, it's 246 units. And in terms of these two numbers, everything about electricity, magnetism, and beta decay, weak interactions, is completely determined in terms of these two parameters. And for example, uh, from these parameters, you can determine the mass of the W to be 80, the mass of the Z to be 91, uh, the, de the, the decay rate of the muon, of the W, and so on, right? And so the standard model is now universally accepted. Uh, and that's why it's called standard model. The standard model depends on the vacuum expectation value V, which is the radius of the ring of the Mexican hat. Uh, and it also has to do with the tangential displacements along the ring. And the, this is the Higgs mechanism. But uh, the new ingredient, uh, which is what's causing excitement uh, this year, is the movement perpendicular to the ring, uh, which is the Higgs boson. The uh, expectation about the Higgs boson comes from uh, work done over the past decade on precision electroweak measurements, uh, PU. And let me just give you an example. Uh, the Z particle decaying into a pair of electrons and positrons, that, that's been known for a long time. And uh, you can write down the lowest order decay rate very easily. But uh, it can also happen that the Higgs boson is exchanged uh, as part of this process. This is a high order electroweak interaction. And when that happens, of course, the amplitude with which it happens depends on the mass of the Higgs boson which of course we don't know. Now, if it happens, uh, 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 it depends on the mass of the Higgs boson, then the amplitude uh, you go and calculate turns out depends logarithmically on the mass, very weakly, right? Uh, logarithmically on the mass of the Higgs boson. The very fact that you can calculate uh, these amplitudes and obtain a finite answer uh, is because yang mills theory is what we call renormalizable. Uh, it, can, it gives you a finite answer. And precision measurements have allowed us to determine these amplitudes, of course, with some error bar, and therefore to get an estimate on the mass of the Higgs boson, even though you don't observe it directly. It occurs only in some intermediate process. And a global fit to all tons of data uh, up to a few years ago suggested that the mass of the Higgs boson would be in the range 100 to 150 uh, uh, GeV. Pretty heavy. One GeV is the mass of a proton. And there is actually no reason we know of why it has to be this range. Uh, it could be a thousand, it could be a million, in which case the experiments would not have been possible. And this was a global fit. The yellow bits were excluded by other considerations, and there was only a band uh, shown in white here for which that in that window, everybody thought based on these indirect measurements uh, that the Higgs particle, if it exists, uh, would be found. So that was the situation until a couple of years ago. That was the expectation, the window in, within which uh, people wanted to search for the Higgs particle. So now I come to the experimental search. So what's the general idea of the experiment? Uh, is that you try to smash two protons together at very high energy, and it produces all kinds of particles, say X. And then the X decays into, let's say, two particles. Let me call them Y1 and Y2. And the Y1 and Y2 are sufficiently stable and long-lived that you can measure its momenta and energy. And from the momentum and energy, you can determine the mass of the X, which is so short-lived, you don't actually see it. And then you accumulate a histogram, okay? So this time, I measure something that might be an, an X uh, with a mass of 99. Next time, 120, okay? So you build a histogram, and if there's a peak in that histogram, that would tell you that maybe there is a particle with that mass. So that, that's the general idea of uh, doing such high energy experiments. In this case, uh, we have the happy circumstance that the size, the height of that peak is something you can predict in advance. So if you find such a peak, it must be the right size for it to be what you expect. If it's too large, too small, uh, a peak would be something else, would be a mystery. And I think I will skip over the reason why uh, we know the size of the peak. Uh, but uh, just uh, believe me that, uh, and, and part of the reason why it is known, again, is because QCD, part of the strong interactions, because QCD is described by yang mills theory, which is computable, at, at least at large momenta. And, and that is the reason why the size of the peak is known. So let me uh, tell you a little bit about the experiment. So the first thing you need to do in an experiment is to accelerate the protons to very high energy and smash them together. 
So you need an accelerator, and the accelerator uh, that everybody now talks about is that CERN, uh, and that's what the uh, initial stands for. But actually, uh, they've changed their name, but not their initial. Uh, the first word meaning council originally was just a council, a meeting. Uh, now it's called the organization, European uh, Research Nuclear. Uh, technically, strictly speaking, it should be now OERN rather than CERN. But the name uh, CERN has so stuck in everybody's mind that they decided to maintain the uh, ac acronym, even though it is no longer an acronym. Uh, this is an aerial view. The red lines are, of course, uh, drawn by hand uh, of CERN. CERN is uh, in Geneva but not entirely in Geneva. Geneva, you know, is in Switzerland. Uh, this uh, uh, has to stand, extend to the next country, France. And this is a map of the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, and the main ring is the uh, big blue circle, and the small ring is one of the injector rings. And just to give you a, a sense of the size, uh, the diameter is about 10 kilometers. So maybe from Sha Tin to Taipo, something like this, okay? And this is a view of the inside of the Large Hadron Collider, inside the tube forming the ring, right? So the protons uh, will be traveling in these uh, tubes, uh, which is at extremely high vacuum. And just to give you a sense of how big these tubes are, this is one person in a bicycle. And this tube bends around the circle of uh, 10 kilometers. To give you a sense of, of the size of this experiment, it's the largest machine in the world. Circumference 27 kilometers. There are 9,000 9, magnets. And a magnet, I don't mean something like this. A magnet is something like this, okay? Uh, it is cooled to very low temperatures, uh, first with 80 tons of liquid nitrogen down to 80 Kelvin, and then 120 tons of liquid helium down to 2 Kelvin. So it's the largest refrigerator in the world. Uh, the particles uh, are accelerated to very close to the velocity of light, 0.9999999. The speed of light, and the energy is so many electron volts. Uh, so you know what, it, what a volt is. Uh, the battery in here is uh, what uh, 1.5 volts or something. Huh? Uh, this is uh, so many volts, okay? And it is actually the best vacuum in the world. The vacuum in the tube uh, is one tenth uh, that of the surface of the moon, because if you have any bit of air in there then the protons that are going around will hit the air and get all destroyed. So you need a very high vacuum. And when uh, the thing is used to do heavy iron experiments, uh, the effective temperature is uh, 100,000 times uh, that at the center of the sun. And it has the most powerful supercomputer system in the world, both locally in Geneva and remotely linked to something like 10,000 uh, computers uh, around the world. And, and I don't mean these things, right? Each one is a supercomputer. So you have the accelerator with the protons going around. So when they hit each other, every once in a while, you need detectors to measure the products. And there are two main detectors at two points uh, in the ring, uh, called a toroidal LHC apparatus, uh, ATLAS, and the compact muon solenoid, CMS. And this is a view of the ATLAS detector. So the protons are traveling along the beam into the page and outside out of the page, and the detection apparatus goes around like this. Uh, so that every direction is covered. Uh, to give you a sense of the size, this is a man. Okay? And uh, this is a schematic of the atlas. Uh, the size is 53 meters long. Uh, how much is this room? This room is maybe 15 meters. Something like this, okay? 35 meters tall, 30 meters wide, and the floor is 92 meters uh, below ground level. And it weighs 7,000 tons. The other experiment, CMS, is a bit smaller, but uh, basically the design is the same. And again, I think you can see, see some people here, I think. Okay? Uh, and the beam is traveling this way. Uh, this is an illustration of a uh, scattering event. You have uh, two protons coming together, forms a Higgs particle, decays into two Zs, and each Z decays into two muons. So in the end, you see four muons going through a cross-section of the detector like this, and this is a reconstruction uh, from the signals obtained from the detectors. You see four uh, uh, very rapidly traveling objects. These are, this is a four-muon event. The collaborations are huge. ATLAS in involves 3,000 scientists and 1,000 students doing one single experiment. CMS, about the same. 
and a typical publication has 2,000 authors. And let me just show you, and, and the author list looks like a, reads like a telephone directory. This is the Atlas authors, and I'm showing you the A's and the beginning of the B's, okay? So they have been accumulating data for almost a year, and they have encountered how many collisions? Uh, eight times 10 to the 14 proton-proton collisions. And uh, people tend to uh, express this in terms of inverse femtobombs. Uh, that's 12 inverse femtobombs. Uh, that just means if the cross-section is one femtobomb, you would have seen 12 events. So the results announced in July. Let me just show you the raw results first. I told you about histograms, right? You plot the histogram, you see a bump. Uh, that's a particle. This is the raw data, right, the points. The red line is the background, noise. And supposedly, this little bump is the Higgs-like particle. And if you subtract the background, it is this little bump. You believe it? Which goes to show that in all these experiments, it takes very sophisticated statistical techniques to take the signal out from the data. And this is a slightly more cleaned up data. This is the uh, Higgs particle decaying into two photons, uh, cleaned up, and you see now you have a credible bump at 125. This is an excess bump. This is the Higgs-like boson. For the four lepton events, uh, the two Zs decaying into, let's say, a mu pair each. Uh, this is the uh, raw data. Uh, the blue part is basically background, other processes. This unexpected bump shown in red uh, is supposed to be due to a Higgs boson at 128.6. Uh, the four leptons, again, this is another plot. I think this is from Atlas. And in this case, it is this extra blue bump uh, which is supposed to be the signal. Uh, the analysis of all the data, very sophisticated uh, uh, statistics, uh, is published typically uh, in these graphs where they show now the ratio of the observed uh, uh, event rate, what we call cross-section, over what it would be if there, would be, there was a Higgs at that mass, okay? So if there is a Higgs, you should see something at one. Now, this is a log scale. This is 0.1, that's 10. If it is pure background, uh, it would be uh, this dotted line, which is the expected uh, signal if it is pure background, that there is no such Higgs. And the green band, is uh, the expected signal plus or minus one standard deviation. The yellow band is two standard deviations. And this is the experimental result after analysis. That if you assume that the mass is, say, 200, 300, the result is completely consistent, basically within one sigma, with there being no Higgs particle, just background. But here, you see something that has two properties. One, it is not consistent with this broken line. It is not consistent with the fact that you have just background. And secondly, its absolute magnitude is consistent with being one. In fact, it seems to be a little bit more than one, which is a little bit worrying, okay? Uh, I told you earlier that the magnitude is something predictable. Uh, it should, if you find two, then it's a problem. Uh, uh, it's not the bigger, the better, okay? And this is a similar plot uh, on a slightly different scale. Let's go back. Uh, this is on a large scale. This is the Atlas uh, uh, results on a very large scale, from the range of 100 to 600. This is a similar plot from uh, CMS, I think CMS, uh, but on a smaller range, 110 to 150. Same idea. Everywhere here, it is consistent uh, within, with no signal, and here is a large signal. Almost two, uh, slightly worrying. And uh, this is an even more sophisticated plot, and what they show is by analyzing all the data at particular masses, is it, what is the probability that the experimental result is only due to the background, due to noise and no real signal, okay? And so if you have a dip, that means that the probability is so low uh, that it must be uh, uh, not due to uh, uh, the background. So you see everywhere else, uh, things are basically okay. Look at the black line, which is the consolidation of all the exper experimental data. It goes to a probability of almost 10 to the minus seven. So uh, what we mean is that the, based on the data, the probability that it is just a fluke, just noise and not a real signal, the probability is 10 to the minus 7. 
And that is what we mean by five sigma, five standard deviations away. And, and this is uh, the basis of the announcement. Okay. And you may remember a few months back, people were talking about data at two or three sigma. That, that's the earlier data when they had uh, 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 less data. If you look at not just every process, but individual channels, uh, uh, and plot the strength of the signal uh, relative to what you expect. So this is uh, decaying into BB, decaying into tau tau, H is the Higgs, okay? Various decay channels. Uh, zero would be there is no signal, no Higgs. One would be uh, it is just exactly what you expect. And you see overall is more or less consistent with one, it's especially these numbers, uh, this combined of everything uh, is signal strength is 1.2 plus or minus about 0.3. So very consistent uh, with what you expect. Except that this one seems to be a little bit too high, two standard deviations away. And if that persists uh, with more data, that could be a problem. It could mean that there is uh, the Higgs boson, but it's a little bit more complicated than the simplest model would suggest. So uh, uh, it's not the end of the story. There is a lot of work, uh, further work to be done. So uh, this is the statement uh, from the experimentalist that the new particle observed at about 125 is compatible. That's all they say. They do not say it, it is. It is compatible within the limited statistical accuracy with being the standard model Higgs boson. Okay? So experimentalists are very careful. However, more data are required to measure its properties, such as the decay rates in the various channels, like I just showed you now and ultimately is spin and parity. Because this particle, depending on the spin and parity, would shoot off the decay particles in different patterns, different angular patterns. And hence, ascertain whether it is indeed the standard model Higgs boson or the result of new physics beyond the standard model. Now, because it's spin, if it's a Higgs boson, it will be spin zero. That means if you go to its rest mass, uh, the decay uh, pattern should be totally uh, symmetrical in all directions. And if that should turn out not to be the case, that would be something very strange. And by the way, I, I should mention one thing that, uh, again, sometimes young students don't realize. Uh, physicists get more excited when the results are unexpected. If it turns out to be expected, it's nice. But if it's unexpected, you would have found something uh, new. And by the end of 2012, in a few months' time, CMS expects to more than triple its total data sample and hence to probe further the nature of this new particle. So this is ongoing work. And by way of conclusion, the work that has been announced over the last few months uh, provides good evidence for at least a Higgs-like particle at a mass of 125. It seems to interact in a way as predicted by Yang Mills. And going back to the conceptual problem, it reconciles two superficially contradictory requirements. Namely, that on the one hand, the intermediate vector boson experimentally has a large mass, but that it should have zero mass, according to Yang and Mills. And come back uh, to the uh, problem posed by Professor Yang in his 1954 paper, we come to the question of the mass of the B quantum, B quantum which is just the intermediate vector boson, to which we do not have a satisfactory answer. Now we do have a satisfactory answer uh, due to this work. And now it is consistent with experimental information. That is the uh, problem posed by Yang in 1954, and which now seems to be satisfactorily resolved. So, and trying to answer this question has driven the advance of particle physics for almost 60 years. It is now answered satisfactorily, beautifully, elegantly, and it relies on the interplay of zero, several subtle ideas. Yang Mills theory and parity, also due to Yang, are both important in this story. So with that, happy birthday to Professor Yang. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Yang. I believe that many of you would like to ask questions. And in case you feel more comfortable asking questions in Cantonese, please do so. And I'll translate it to the audience for you. <laughs> 
questions。唔使拍手啊！可以用廣東話問下。啊、uh, ，Professor， you just skip the part on how the females、uh, acquire mass from the、uh, Higgs boson. Can you explain a little bit about this? Oh, the fermions acquiring mass. Okay. All right. So I have to go back.、Oh, no, I have to find. Oh, let 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 me just 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 write here. Maybe easier. If you have the fermion propagating, and it has some mass m, that's the、uh, picture I would draw.、Uh, but if it interacts with the Higgs boson, with a coupling constant、uh, c, okay, and if the Higgs、uh, particle has a vacuum expectation value v, then this picture is the same as that picture if m is equal to c times v.、Okay. And this actually can happen、uh, with one any one. Uh, fermion, so the I fermion、uh, with a certain coupling C I, so M I is equal to C I times V.、Right. And、uh, you may ask why this is only one uh, uh, Higgs boson and not two. For that, you have to write down、uh, the theory, and it comes down to the dimensions. The fermion has dimension three half, and、uh, this has dimension one. So if you add two of them, that has too many dimensions, and that that gets you into trouble. So uh, uh, this is the basic、uh, formula. So the interaction is proportional to the mass. Now this actually、uh, should remind you of the principle of equivalence, because、uh, in gravity, the interaction of a particle with gravity, that is its weight, is proportional to its mass. That is the principle of equivalence. So we also have a kind of principle of equivalence here, provided. You don't have a bare mass to start with. That is,、uh, you don't have a, the mass was zero in the absence of this mechanism.、Okay. Does that answer your question, to some extent? I just want to ask for bare mass to be zero. Uh, you have to go along this minimum、um, path. So, what makes that happen? Why? What, what drives it to go always along the minimum path instead of?、Uh, oh, that's the bare mass of a certain degree of freedom, which is called the Goldstone、uh, degree of freedom.、Uh, nothing actually drives it around. It is just a possible direction of motion. It is a degree of freedom, which, when excited. Does not require any extra energy, so that's called the Goldstone theorem. It said that whenever you have spontaneous uh, uh, breaking of symmetry in this form, there will be a degree of freedom with zero mass. In fact, when it was first uh, 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 proposed, people thought it was a problem because、uh, there are no zero mass particles in the universe, except those we already know and doesn't fit into here. So people didn't pay much attention to the Goldstone theorem. It was thought to be a problem. But then,、uh, when the Higgs and so on paper came came about,、uh, it was not a problem because we just need one extra zero degree,、uh, zero mass degree of freedom. So it's just wonderful.、Uh, so、uh, that's how it came about. So question in the back.、Uh, first, I want to say thank you for your lecture, and、uh, I get a little more familiar with the theory. And just now, you have mentioned in. Uh, the uh, the latter part of the lecture that the symmetry dictates interaction, and then in the end you mentioned parity because I'm not、uh, I I've just get familiar with the theory, so I want you to explain more about、uh, symmetry and the parity and yeah that kind of thing. Thank you. Okay, I think I recognize you. You are one of our new graduate students. You are one of our new graduate students. Yeah, I'm Ivy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, symmetry dictates interactions、uh, is a famous saying by Professor Yang.、Uh, if you really want to understand it, you have to come take my course, PHY four five one zero, which is the course I co-teach with Professor Yang. It's all, all about that idea. Some of the students here、uh, have taken that course,、uh, but the idea is simply this. Uh, if you insist that you have gauge symmetry, a local symmetry 
then the Lagrangian that you can write down is heavily constrained. In fact, so heavily constrained, it is basically unique up to one parameter. So once you specify the symmetry, so long as it is a gauge symmetry of the Yang-Wills type, you know the nature of the interaction up to one parameter. That's why it is such a powerful principle. Okay? And uh, in fact, in that course, I, I will actually derive that. Uh, so that is symmetry uh, uh, dictating interactions. Now, when I say uh, use that on parity, that is an extension of that idea. Uh, and sort of in, in reverse, uh, uh, interaction dictating symmetry. That, in other words, uh, because the weak interaction involves only the left-hand part. So you must have a symmetry. Uh, in this case, it is an SU2 symmetry uh, related only to the left-handed part of the spinner uh, of the wave function, left-handed part of the wave function, and not the right-handed part. And if you require the symmetry uh, to be an exact symmetry when you rotate the left-handed part but do nothing to the right-handed part, then you can easily show that a mass term is not allowed. All right? And uh, that's a mathematical statement, but the physical idea behind that I have already mentioned. Namely, that if there is a mass, you can go to the rest frame, and then you can't distinguish between left and right, right-handed spins. Okay? And, and therefore, that means it cannot have a mass because you have uh, interaction only with the left-handed part, you are not allowed to have a mass. Not allowed to have a mass until you turn on interactions. Okay? Excuse me. Excuse me, I want to ask, what are the relationships between the zero mass particle and the oscillation of the electric field and magnetic field in a propagation of EM waves? Uh, okay. You all know about EM waves, light. Uh, uh, so in, when you have light, uh, that is a wave propagating from the light bulb to here, direction of propagation, electric field and magnetic field in the perpendicular directions, right? That's what, uh, high school, what high school students learn. Now, it turns out light is not truly continuous. If you turn the intensity down and down and down so low, you, you can find by careful experiments that actually come as single particles called photons. And those photons are massless. They don't have mass. Okay? And it is only because they don't have mass that it is possible to have only two polarizations and not the third. Okay? Uh, let me repeat the argument. If they do have mass, then they cannot be traveling at, the, at C, okay? the ultimate velocity. And therefore, you can run alongside it and it would appear to be at rest. If it is at rest, there is no way to distinguish between transverse and longitudinal because longitudinal refers to the direction of motion. When you have no motion, uh, what is longitudinal? So there is no way to ban the longitudinal polarization, and you must have three. And if you have three, when you are running along with it, by Lorentz transformation, uh, it must remain three in every other frame. Uh, thank you. Um, I would like to ask that what uh, extra, uh, um, maybe some evidence to prove the existence of the Higgs, uh, Higgs, Higgs bosons? Because they say that it is a Higgs-like particle, and what do we need further? Thank okay. you. Well, first of all, uh, the bump has to be much clearer. That's uh, simple, to establish the existence of a particle at that mass. I think that evidence is uh, pretty good now but I think it could be further improved to reduce the noise. Secondly, uh, as I said, uh, this particle you have to look at is decay patterns. You know, when it decays into par particles, what is the angular distribution? And that will tell you uh, whether it is spinning, whether, because the Higgs particles are supposed not to be spinning, has spin zero. So the decay should be isotropic, uh, the same in all directions. If that doesn't turn out, to, turn out not to be the case, then it would have to be something else. Then there is another concept called, called the parity, uh, that uh, the, the decay pattern has to be sort of uh, uh, symmetric uh, when you reflect it. So that would establish uh, the spin and the parity. Then the Higgs boson also is supposed to have uh, certain properties. For example, its decay rate into various different so-called channels, the different ways of decaying, each has a particular predicted rate, and all those have to be checked. And uh, you have no free parameters. And you are checking maybe you know, eight or 10 uh, different decay amplitudes. And if they all come out to 
to be correct, then I think people will be quite comfortable in saying that it is indeed a Higgs particle, a Higgs boson as predicted. Now, there are actually many versions of the uh, Higgs bosons. What uh, people have written down, what I have shown, is just the simplest possible version. If the simplest possible version doesn't quite work, it is likely that we would have to invoke a slightly more complicated version and rescue the theory. Uh, good morning, Professor Yang. Uh, may I ask you some question? Is it uh, seems that the standard models has predicted uh, already uh, sixty-one of the standard particles. So may I ask that if the if the LHC proof that the uh, boson shadow is not the actually the heat heat boson? So what what will happen to the standard mod model? Thank okay. you. Now uh, let me see if I, I understood your question correctly. This, you say that the standard model is already so successful in explaining a host of phenomena in electroweak interactions. What if the Higgs boson turns out not to be the case? Uh, what would happen? Now, as I try to emphasize, I try to distinguish between the Higgs mechanism, which is going round that circle, and the Higgs boson, which is going perpendicular to the circle. Uh, there are possible ways for, by which you can preserve all the properties of going round the circle while doing something slightly different perpendicular to the circle. So uh, not having a Higgs boson uh, need not be necessarily fatal to the standard model, uh, for which there is so much experimental evidence. Now, the whole idea depends on the Higgs interaction. You see the, the, the Mexican hat. Let me take a cross-section of the Mexican hat. And that goes uh, because we go as minus 5 squared plus 5, 4. Okay? with some uh, coefficients. Okay? And that basically constrained the theory. Now you may ask, why am I allowed only to write a quartic fourth order? Uh, that, that is actually a belief in renormalizable theory that you are not allowed to write anything higher. Because uh, if you do so, uh, when you start computing, you again get infinities that you don't know how to deal with. Okay? But I don't know whether that's a fundamental uh, objection because uh, if you go higher, you get infinities. That could be simply be because we are dumb. We don't know how to handle the infinities. It may not be a problem with nature. It's a problem with us. Could be. Uh, uh, not many people would believe that. Uh, uh, that. The requirement that the theory be computable without infinities actually imposes very serious constraints on what you can write down. And, and, and nothing very complicated. Okay? And, and it's a very interesting idea that by things that look simple are the only things that make sense. If you write things that are, if you write phi to the sixth power, uh, uh, you get infinities uh, when, when you keep co computing. And, and that's one of the successes of uh, quantum field theory and makes life actually much simpler in, in a certain way that you need not explore all possibilities that you can dream of, but only a limited range. Um, uh, my question is very simple. That it, is there any fundamental objection um, to the fourth generation of the quarks? Uh, or is it just a simple argument of the exper experimentalness? Uh, I think there is no fundamental objection to, to a fourth generation, uh, at, uh, at least not that I know of. Uh, the experimental evidence uh, comes from the decay, the width of the Z particle. The Z decaying into a pair of neutrinos uh, each possible pair contributes one unit to the decay possibilities. Okay? So the width uh, is three times uh, uh, something. And if you have a fourth generation of neutrinos, it will be four times something, provided, of course, the neutrino mass is pretty small. Uh, so that, as far as I know, uh, uh, is, uh, is the situation. And the whole problem of the generations is largely not understood. Now, there are all kinds of speculative ideas. You, you would find proposals, uh, but they are only proposals. Uh, uh, and this is, again, something that needs to be worked on. Okay. We actually have some of our graduate students uh, took a little part in, in the CERN. Uh, they were in CERN and, and was at that experiment uh, helping out. Uh, unfortunately, they are all out of town at a conference. Uh, in the training, um, sort of data analysis training in Taiwan, yeah. they're actually learning how to do this analysis that Professor Young is mentioning. 
So un otherwise, I would have asked them to tell you their experiments, uh, their, their experience uh, in participating in this huge experiment. So uh, high school students, if you join us, you know, five, six years from now, you can take part in these experiments. <laughs> Uh, can Professor C. N. Yang uh, give us a talk on uh, uh, the Yang Mu theory? <laughs> okay, uh, make sure you record this and uh, show it to Professor Yang. All right. Any other questions? This one here. Professor Yang, uh, near the end of your talk, you mentioned. Uh, several experiments agree with each other, but there's one outlier with the, this two. Uh, what kind of discovery will you anticipate uh, regarding these two in the experiments? Well, my, my attitude, and I think most, the attitude of most physicists, uh, is that let's not jump ahead of ourselves. It is now only a two standard de deviation uh, discrepancy and we typically take three, four, five standard deviations before we take it very seriously. Uh, you look at the raw data, you see uh, it's not that simple. Uh, so let's pin the data down first before speculating. And uh, pinning the data down, I think, would take a few more months. Yeah. Yes. Will the proton uh, decay actually? Will they decay? Uh, will, uh, they decay? will the proton decay? So that's a good question, nobody knows. Uh, and it's an interesting question for the following reason. Although the electric and weak interactions are unified in what I have described by a yang mills theory, the strong interactions is also described by a yang mills theory, but they are two different yang mills theories that are not yet unified, right? Not yet unified in the sense, uh, if I use mathematical language, they are the exterior product of two uh, separate Lie groups with different coupling constants, and that's not satisfactory. So people have asked the question whether or not they can be unified into a single so-called grand unified theory in a single group, single symmetry group. If you uh, go along that path, it is possible to write down such theories. And the simplest possible one is called, I think, SU5. And if you do that, a consequence of that theory is that the proton is not stable. Okay? And in the simplest possible version of that theory, the lifetime of the proton is, I think, predicted to be 10 to the 30 or 31 years. Very careful experimental uh, searches have been done, and I think it has been ruled out. Uh, a lifetime of that order magnitude is ruled out. But it does not rule out the possibility that the proton may decay with a lifetime of, say, 10 to the 35 years. Okay? Now, if it's a lifetime of 10 to the 35 years, what does that mean? That means if you have 10 to the 35 protons in the universe, one of them will decay in the next year. So it's, in principle, detectable. Right? You don't have to wait uh, that long. You can do the experiment in one year, provided you have a large sample and high precision. So the naive, the simplest version of grand unified theory is ruled out by experiment. Uh, but uh, the proton, the lifetime of the proton, uh, we have no guarantee that it is uh, perfectly stable. And in some sense, people tend to believe that it probably will uh, decay. I, that would be my belief. There is no, no fundamental reason uh, to, let me put it this way. The, the re usual belief that it is stable depends on a certain conservation law, the conservation of baryon number. Uh, that is something we are told when, you know, when I was a graduate student. That's something we learned. It's a conservation law. But what is the reason for it? Actually, there's no good reason for it. Uh, and nowadays, we tend to believe that every good conservation law must be based on a yang mills theory, a gauge principle. And there is no gauge principle connecting to, connected to baryon number. So uh, people's gut feeling is that at some level, we don't know the, the number, uh, that should be violated and protons should decay. But don't worry, not in your lifetime. Uh, yeah, go good morning, I'm Professor Yang. And I have a question that's uh, how, the detect, how, how the structure of the detectors is used to detect the, pro, pro, detect the proton to have a collision of this 
structure. I don't know, I don't know what structure of the detectors is used. Oh, what are, what is the nature of the detectors used uh, in these experiments? Uh, yes. Is, is that a question? So uh, after the collisions, all kinds of things fly out, and the most important ones in the end, after a series of decays, are either electrons, muons, or photons, and some protons and so on. So what you need are just uh, detectors that are able to tell you that, for example, an, a muon is passing through with a certain speed, a certain energy. And the idea is, although it's now much more sophisticated, the idea is not all that different from cloud chambers that you have all heard about in, in high school. That when a charged particle goes through, it causes ionization. And when there is ionization, there are electrical phenomena that allows you to measure it. Okay? Uh, of course, nowadays, uh, uh, you, 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 you don't use cloud chambers, but all kinds of uh, uh, other detectors. Uh, also, uh, for particles moving through a medium, if it's moving faster than the velocity of light in that medium, it would emit a kind of uh, light called Trankov radiation, and you can simply use a phototube, which is sort of like, like, a, like a camera, uh, to detect that light. Uh, and there are all kinds of detectors. And, and you see, uh, when you have 3,000 uh, uh, physicists in that experiment, uh, each, each small group of maybe 10 people, 20 people, would be responsible for one piece of the detector. And they are just experts in designing, uh, troubleshooting, uh, improving that detector. So they are detector experts of various types. So uh, interactions are caused by exchange of particles, right? Just like EM interactions caused by exchange of photons. And I know some scientists are proposing that for gravity is by interchanging gravitons. But the problem is that why we always talk about the uh, unification of uh, weak, strong, and EM interactions. But how, why is it the gravity so difficult to be unified? And why is that we cannot discover uh, gravitons or we don't have any experiments studying about this? phenomenon. Thank you. Okay. Well, the simple answer is because we are all dumb. We are not smart enough. Uh, we haven't succeeded. Einstein didn't succeed. Yang didn't succeed. Nobody has succeeded. Uh, uh, one reason uh, is actually uh, the graviton uh, has spin two. And spin two means it has lots of uh, nasty polarizations. And it's even less renormalizable uh, than yang mills theory basically because it is not renormalizable. You calculate uh, uh, gravity uh, beyond one loop. Look at its quantum corrections. Uh, every which way you try to calculate, you get infinities. So there is no consistent theory, as far as we know, uh, of uh, quantum gravity. Unless you make things very complicated, strings, brains, and uh, uh, super strings, that sort of thing, uh, maybe. But that brings in so many other speculative compo components that uh, uh, people are a little bit wary uh, to believe that it is a, an honest description of nature at this point. Um, Professor Yang, I, uh, I can't understand uh, what, I've, what you've mentioned in the second page that uh, both the experiment mass and that mass equals to zero can, uh, can, can, can be satisfied. Oh, uh, this is a rather cryptic remark that I made deliberately, that the mass can be both zero and non-zero. Okay? Now, uh, let me be, uh, state that precisely. And unfortunately, the only way to make precise statement is to write down mathematical formulas. Uh, the question is uh, whether the propagator of uh, the particle with momentum k uh, goes as, I, I, I skipped some numbers, goes as this or goes as this. Okay? Uh, let me write, write a bit more. Something, something like this, k squared. No, no, not this one, but this one. Okay, let, let me be, be a bit precise. The gauge dependent part, the spin dependent part, either goes as g mu nu plus k mu k nu over k square, or g mu nu plus k mu k nu over m square. Uh, uh, that's the gauge dependent factor, oh sorry, over k. Yeah, I, th I, think, I think that's correct. Uh, and in general, uh, you know, this is okay, because when k becomes large, this stays finite. Uh, this is bad 
uh, because when k goes large, uh, this goes up as k squared. And the question is uh, whether this is correct or this is correct. Right? And uh, it turns out you can write this together with a certain parameter, C, which is called the gauge parameter. And the gauge parameter does not matter. For one value of the gauge parameter, it goes to this form. For another, it goes to that form. Physics does not depend on the value of C. So you can have the best of both worlds. So that, that is a rather subtle statement that in all your computations, you have to use a parameter called C. You have to choose some value. But the end result does not depend on the value. Okay? So, so that is a sophisticated version of the statement I made with respect to the pigeons. Okay? There are certain things that you need, but do not matter. And for one value, it looks like uh, m is equal to 0. For another value, it looks like m is not equal to 0. Okay. So uh, the propagator, either you use the Feynman gauge, the Landau gauge, or whatever. Professor Yang, hello, and I'm um, something simple question. I'm not sure. Here, my question is the theory. That's, uh, we saw a problem coming, uh, coming to a mass. But I'm saying, if according to the experiment, uh, that's the huge boson is a real particle. How about um, the antiparticle of the huge boson? The antiparticle of the Higgs boson is, is the Higgs boson itself. OK, thank you. Just like the photon. In the mathematical expression, I, uh, I have seen that uh, the mass can be zero or not zero, but uh, is it mean that uh, it's not matter uh, whether the mass is zero or non-zero? OK, again, back to this question. Uh, the mass has several meanings. When it uh, appears in these intermediate formulas, you can choose it to be either zero or non-zero. Okay? And that helps you get rid of the infinities. But in the asymptotic states, the particle that you actually measure, uh, what we call on the mass shell and asymptotic states, it has a definite value. And it is for the Higgs boson, it's certainly non-zero. But by the way, this is not the mass of the Higgs boson. This is the mass of the intermediate vector boson. The intermediate vector boson has been measured, the W and the Z, 80 and 90, roughly speaking, respectively, G and E. But the point is, in intermediate processes, you can pretend as if it is zero and still get the correct answer. Uh, maybe I should say one, one other thing. What if I, I insist it's not zero? Then I say you have lots of infinities. That should still be correct. But all the infinities should cancel among themselves. Some plus infinity, some minus infinity. But how, how can you be sure that all those complex infinities cancel? You go to the other gauge, what's called the uh, 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 R gauge, the renormalizable gauge, to do an equivalent calculation where the cancellation becomes obvious. Okay. Any other questions? If not, let's thank Professor Yang again. And in case you are crazy enough, you still want to ask questions, you're welcome to stay behind. A few of us uh, will stay behind to entertain your questions, in Cantonese even, right? Okay, thank you all for coming. <laughs>